everyone's, I presume, is in the beginning of their dissertation or trying to fix up these different parts. Um, while we're waiting for a few other people to come on in, i um, curious where you are in the process. Some people may not have started. Some people may be on a second or third revision of this lit review. And what school are you going to? So, and what department are you in? So, where are you? What school and what department? And you can just type it into the chat box to the under the, in your chat window under type message here, and um, and then just hit send. So, if you want to go ahead and do that. Also, we're going to be taking questions around any part of the introduction lit review, and, um, and if it's like other ones. We kind of run it loose around here where you can ask questions about any aspect of the dissertation process. And to the extent that I can answer them, I will be glad to. But uh, at the moment, I am, I am curious about uh, where you're going to school and where you are in the process. All right. So, and, um, okay. So, NCU, NOVA. The Maharishi University, huh. all right, Capella, Pittsburgh, Walden, okay. You are one responsive group over there, okay. Northeastern, I applied to Northeastern back in the day. Concordia, okay. Lots of Capella, Walden. Valdosa. And how did you hear about us? Did you hear about us through, I mean, I, I know that we, you know, go out to Walden and Capella, but uh, how did you, how did you hear about us? Did you, were you referred by friends and colleagues or, you know, how did that occur? Emails or, you know, what's going on there? I'll just go ahead and type that in and we'll, I'm going to keep going here. Um, before we get started, you know, my training was in clinical psychology. So part of my job is to keep everyone fully motivated and uh, to keep myself motivated too. So, you know, and sometimes, not always, but sometimes, you know, you can get kind of feeling victimized, right? I'm in a dissertation process, so my edits are going on, or I'm not getting the support, or whatever it is. And I just want to tell you that you know, if, when we step back for a moment, we put ourselves in situations, and it's our job to get ourselves out, okay? So, um, you know, j just w when you're feeling like the world's against you a bit, realize we're responsible. Let's get ourselves, pick ourselves up. Let's get ourselves out of here, and let's, let's get on to the life that we want to live, okay? All right. With that said, we're ready to get started here. Um, we're ready to get going. Okay. All righty. So, um, introduction, lip review. Again, ask questions. Oops. Ask questions as you'd like. Uh, let me see here. Let me just present. Present. And, uh, well, okay. So, ask, ask questions as you'd like, and uh, they'll get passed over to me, and um, we'll get started. Okay. So the dissertation, uh, kind of look at it as an hourglass. You'll notice that the introduction and review is kind of a larger portion than the more circumscribed methodology, which is kind of narrowed and tight, which is basically the lit review and introduction is going to get down to what kind of research questions or hypotheses am I going to examine? And then the methodology, how am I going to examine that question? The results, what did we find? Again, very narrow, circumscribed. And then discussion section is kind of broader, more uh, speculative in nature. Um, no rights or wrongs in the introduction, lit review, and discussion, I would say. And methodology and results, you know, they're different animals. So at the moment, we'll, we'll, we're just going to be dealing with that top part of your hourglass. Okay. So the introduction. Introduction is, you know, what, what what is the research problem here? Okay, why study this topic? Really, why are we studying this topic? 
you have to make that case to your reader that it's an important issue to study. If no one's it doesn't have to change the world, but if no one's excited about it, let me say, not that excited, but excited enough to keep reading, um, you have to share why is it important. You know, and, and don't, I would say, don't worry about, um, well, certainly don't worry about changing the world, but also um, it doesn't have to be a completely novel, you know, change the world kind of study. It could be an old survey in a new population or in a different time, things of this sort. So a minor tweaks, or as my old professor used to say, you know, wrinkles in the old research uh, will be sufficient for a vast majority of you to have a important new newish kind of question to answer. Identify the variables. You know, when when I think about research questions, and I really do love research questions, it's very simple. Identify the variables or the data that you can get. When you identify the variables and the data, you can start putting those together and start asking questions of that. So oftentimes when you're thinking about your topic, think about what, what, am I, what can I measure, be it qualitative or quantitative, and then start asking questions about them. Um, what are the procedures? That is, you're going to have to lay out a little bit of how you might go about examining those questions. What are you going to do? You're not going to like uh, consult a Ouija board. You're going to have to have specific methodology, a methodology to, to systematically and reliably assess those questions. So you're going to talk about some of those measures. The good news is you don't have to create this thing from scratch. You should, you know, be looking at previous research articles, okay, and looking at those methodologies, and looking at those survey instruments, and looking at those participants. Don't worry about it being completely novel. Use what's out there, particularly in their discussion chapter when they discussion section of those peer-reviewed articles. They're going to say future research might look at dot 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 whatever that is. Now, you might just want to take a piece of that. So you don't have to redo, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can look at other research and say, hmm, that's interesting enough that I'm going to investigate it or investigate a piece of that, all right? And just a few pages in length. Okay, so literature review. Literature, body of work, review, the survey of. So you're just surveying the body of work of what's been done in that topic. It needs, you know, they say it needs to be, you know, uh, within past five years is the typical kind of time frame. Fair enough. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about citation chaining and so forth. Uh, but, it, but, you know, you should have, uh, it needs, well, not should have, your requirement is it needs to be within the past five, uh, five years or so. Obviously, the seminal work in the field, like the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, I mean, you're going to have to reference these old guys and gals who kind of started this thing, but, the, but, but then move it up forward to uh, present day. By the way, there's many people who, um, you know, it's, sometimes it takes time to be moving through this process. Try to keep those articles really uh, relevant because if you're out a year or two or if it's at the five-year mark and then you wind up in an extra semester or two and then your articles fall out without the outside of this five-year mark well then you're going to have to go back and do double work so try and keep it as closely as possible to the to the current day all right um, your critical thinking skills make a difference here and what I'm saying is that um, you have to present an argument to that committee. It falls in line with the interestingly interesting uh, kind of concept. You have to present an argument. Why, why, Paula, are you conducting this study? Why have you selected this topic? Okay. 
Um, so it, 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 your, your, your thinking skills, critical thinking skills, makes a difference. What are the strengths and weaknesses of this thing? You're going to have to think through that. Writing skills matter. My, <laughs> I keep editing until I run out of time. All right? And I edit and edit and edit and edit. Um, that's the way, you know, until, you know, set a time frame. you got to get it off at some point. But, you know, your writing skills matter. Things need to be organized. I mean, if you want an exercise, take a paragraph that you've written, okay, and read the paragraph sentence by sentence backwards. Start from the bottom, last sentence, Make sure that sentence can stand by itself. Then need to read the second to last sentence. Can that stand by itself? And so forth. Each sentence has to stand by itself. Each paragraph should have a topic sentence. That topic sentence should, should then be developed by those other sentences in there. So keep things organized. Subheadings make a difference, right? You have a whole bunch of paragraphs. All of those, so let's just go back for a second. All those paragraphs need to be sequenced appropriately. So one thing to do is make sure that each of the sentences can stand by themselves. The paragraphs are coherent. That is with one theme or one topic. Or you have a topic sentence that says, I'm going to talk about A, B, and C. And then the paragraph develops A, B, and C. Another exercise after you do the sentence by sentence business is that what you've written for each paragraph, write out what the emphasis of that paragraph is. Then make sure that all of those topic sentences in those paragraphs actually make sense. Right? We're telling a story. That story needs to be comprehensible and remembered by people. So write down what is the paragraph intention, what is the topic there, make sure they all kind of hang together. People come to us and say, my professor said that it doesn't flow together. Well, this is exactly what we're talking about. The paragraphs have to flow and have transitions among them. The, sent the paragraphs by themselves have to flow and be coherent. All right. This fourth bullet it's a tough one, although, you know, everyone's paying for things. But, uh, you know, stay in charge of the study the best you can. And I say the best you can. Um, you know, they're going to want to put their fingerprints all over it. The chairperson, the committee, the IRB, okay? That's just the nature of the beast. Um, to the extent that you can direct it, great. To the extent that they're going to want to put their fingerprints all over it, you know, give up a little bit of, about your pride in my baby. Call it our baby and let's move it forward. Okay. Introduction. Let, uh, tell readers what's been done. Identify the gaps in the literature. That's really important. That's where that critical thinking comes in. When you look at different lit reviews and you're summarizing um, those different articles, you can see in it that they're going to tell you the limitations in that discussion section. Read them, use those, and say, hey, article A, B, and C all have these limitations, small sample size. Articles D, E, and F had these limitations. They only studied men and not women, or whatever the limitations were. Okay? Those are the limitations that are going to move you forward and justify your study. That's very important. Okay. Um, search relevant information. That's obvious. Okay. All righty. Uh, any questions? Let's get some questions in here. So Paula asked, um, how do I narrow my topic? I'm going to go back to where I was before. Um, it's the, the question is, what are the variables that you want to study? And then and if you, Paula, send me a couple of variables, we'll figure out a topic right here before we get going. Um, how do you know uh, you're getting the most important sources? Well, <laughs> how do we define an important source, I guess, is one question. Um, you know, P 
you, you should, we, we should know, I mean, at least I did, and you should know, you know, who, who were the important people in the field? Who are the leaders in the field? Who are the prolific people? Um, those are, those are going to be good guides. Um, if you're paying to get your article published in um, something, they may not be the most important. So let's start with review articles. That's going to be an important source. Your top articles in your field, that's going to be a good source. People from really good schools. You don't get to go to University of Pennsylvania and University of Michigan and Harvard for nothing. So some other scholars are finding them as important. So it's not always the case. Um, but but you can but you you know but you can tell um, obviously if you're from good schools you know these top research oriented uh, institutions um, there there are probably some leaders going on I guess uh, and no disrespect to University of Texas but Dan Gilbert used to go to University of Texas um, and but he was a guy and I said am I am I faculty thought, well, he's really up and coming. Well, he wound up at Harvard, you know. I mean, he just had interesting stuff. And if you ever see him, he's in psychology. If you ever see Dan Gilbert talk about happiness on TED Talks or something like this, you can see the guy was headed towards something great. So um, good, peer review, good, good peer review articles, good, good institutions, prolific, being published and making headway, you know. All right, other questions that are coming in here. Um, is there a suggested number of sources to include in a review? No, I don't think that there is. Um, I mean, some schools will put out, you know, 30 or 50. Um, the truth is you just want to, um, um, you, you, you want to cover your bases. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, camera shots, wide angle shots, kind of um, really talking about topic A, excuse me, variable A, or wide angle shot talking about, you know, um, you know, variable B, and then really close up shots. That is articles that are really relating uh, variable A and B together. Uh, and then there's kind of, you know, middle of the road shots. So um, I, I really... <laughs> It's a we we I was I was not raised by having a certain number of articles, and I know that's the requirement for many of you. Um, you know, I think thirty to fifty is the number in there. Um, is there such a thing as too many, too few? Yeah, I mean, one too few, you know, two hundred too many. Um, thirty to fifty seems seems like the reasonable thing. All right. Um, um, okay, how do I organize my research before I start to write article by article? I would start, I would start with the methodology, but I would start with lit review, pulling articles broadly around those um, variables of interest, and then narrowly around them. How do I find variables in the secondary data analysis? Well, for the secondary data analysis, those variables um, should be should be obvious. Um, I mean, what 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 variables do they use in the analyses? Uh, Cynthia, how are variables identified without a topic? You know, and I'll say something about this. Um, so, fair enough question, Cynthia. How are variables identified uh, without a topic? You know, we know what we want to study. Okay. As you went through that program, and as you went through those comprehensive exams, and as you went through those classes, okay, there were some things that piqued your interest and some things did not. People typically know what they want to study. And they know the variables that they want to study. Or they, I work at this company and I can get these kind of HR individuals. And we're talking about culture. So people know what to, uh, what to go after. Um, the variables, well, a, a topic comprises variables, and variables can comprise your topic. So they have a nice symbiotic relationship there. Okay. 
literature is providing context for your study, right? It's got to be empirical, that is, researched, okay? And it's got to be logical. You just can't throw things in willy-nilly there. They have to make some sense. Everything, and I would argue life, <laughs> is a story. You have to tell a story. And that story needs to be comprehensible and compre or comprehended. So you need to tell a story. It's got to be a logical story. I have colleagues here that use reason, right? They argue and they say, this is why, A, B, C, and D. They're logical when they build their case. You need to build your case here as well. Uh, build a coherent argument, answering the why question. Why do I need to say? That's what someone's going to be asking. When they get through reading your introduction and literature, they're going to say, even introduction, why, am I, why are you studying this? Who cares? You have to answer that so what question immediately. And you need to have that in your brain early on. All right. Um, OK, how do we read articles? So you're going to search them. You're going to read them. Okay? You're going to organize them. Right? And then you're going to write about them. That's the basic you know, structure here. When you're searching, keywords matter. So I'll tell you, we as a company help you do that library work. We help you search. We'll put them in a Dropbox for you. That's right. I'm talking to you who doesn't want to go to the library and say, I can't get the article. That's why I can't get moving. E email us. We have librarians that will go and pull those articles. How do we do that? We're going to settle in on keywords first, OK? We're going to say, we're going to, we're going to look at those, and then we're going to pull articles related to those keywords. Use peer-reviewed articles. They may not even accept non-peer-reviewed articles. Um, primary sources is OK. Other dissertations are OK. Uh, start with recent articles. A good reference librarian is worth their weight in gold. Um, they'll help you um, at your school or other places. So um, that's the searching. Uh, we're happy to help you to do that. Um, just email us. OK, um, you should know the databases that your that your field looks for, looks in. Uh, we had, you know, Cyclet back in the day. I'm not sure that we still use Cyclet. Um, you have to have the right keyword terms. Some of these keywords, by the way, are you, you, you put in alcoholism, you're going to get, you know, 10 million articles. Obviously, you're going to have to narrow that down. If you have um, the thymia, okay, in children uh, in this city, you know, you may have to expand that search. So, um, you know, start with the keywords and then expand or contract. Uh, based on the number of results that come back. The citation chain is an important thing. I think I have a slide on it next. Uh, no. So the citation chain is important. So when you find articles, okay, which you will, um, and you can look at citation chain is going back, that is, who have they cited? And they also have citation chaining going forward. That is, who cited the article that you're currently looking at. So this is a uh, uh, important way to kind of help you build a story, a coherent story. Look at their argument. Look how did it change from that time to this time to this next time. What is their thinking going on here? How have their questions been refined? or broadened, or answered. Think through, think through what they, um, their, their logic. All right. Um, what are the big databases in your field? You just get to know that. Um, what terms best describe your topic? Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, listen, we're, we're not, when I was a kid, Right? We had a card index, you know, I mean, it really took a heck of a long time. You're in there, you know, you, you, you guys and gals, 
can go into these library searches anytime, day or night. You can hire people to do it, but you can also go in yourself day or night. You know, make mistakes. It's okay. Go in and say, God, I can't find anything on this, or I found too much on this. Um, let, let me say something about not finding anything about your topic. Occasionally, I come across a student that says, Dr. Lanny, there is nothing on this topic. There is no survey instrument on this area, in this area. And I'll say to you, that may well be true. Now go change your topic. I don't want you, first of all, if you have no literature around this thing, how is this committee going to accept this? There's no way in heck it's going to happen. You have to have something that's been researched. Change the world after you graduate. Don't change the world doing it by trying to invent a field or a study like of this kind. Find something that's been done. All you want to do is put a little twist on it. You know, you're not changing the world here. So if there's really no literature around a particular topic, um, you know, find something else that's been researched for everybody's sake. Mostly yours. Okay. Expanding and narrowing, you can use filters, Boolean logic we talked about, anding and oring. Um, look at the keywords from the other articles. So every article, peer review article is going to have keywords. Use those keywords. Or, hey, here are the, here are the different articles that are really uh, cool that I want to study. Great. What keywords do they have in common? Maybe they're using other words for the same topic, and you can't find anything, but really there's a different language for that topic. Maybe there's several different words for that same topic, and they're all addressing kind of a point into the same area. Here's the citation chaining. Basically, uh, basically you have an article, and you can go back with uh, references or go forward with who's referenced that article. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing to do. Uh, any questions at all? All right. All right. Well, staple remover. All right. All right. Um, Lee, articles seem endless, but not on a specific topic. Entrepreneurial training to make nonprofits sustainable. Articles seem endless, but not on my topic. Okay. So, um, entrepreneurial. Uh, so there's definitely things on nonprofits, Lee, right? And there's definitely things on entrepreneurial training. Um, so you're 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 leaning towards that camp I was just talking about. There's nothing on. Let's imagine that what you're saying is absolutely true. Okay. Do I want you to have to convince a committee that nothing has been done on this whatsoever, but you are going to do this? You're already setting up red flags for yourself with the committee. Why do this? Well, right? We don't want to do this. Huh? And a frowny face. All right. So, all right. Cute so, frowny face. I appreciate that. Um, so what, what, I mean, what is the heart of this? It's, it's, the, the heart of it may well be keeping nonprofits sustainable, okay? Important enough topic and relevant, right? I mean, people want to keep nonprofits are critical to the whole engine of the company, particularly to those underserved. So, you know, um, so maybe it's not about entrepreneurial training. Maybe it's about different kinds of sustainability around nonprofits, all right? And maybe entrepreneurial training could be an aspect of it. What else are nonprofits doing, the sustainable ones versus the non-sustainable ones? What are they doing differently? And talk about, perhaps, or in research, okay, what are, what are the sustainable ones nonprofits doing? 
What's a sustainable nonprofit, by the way? Somebody in business for 10 years? Someone who's had a grant for five years and gets renewed? I mean, start drilling into that. So start with the core, nonprofits, sustainable, perhaps versus non-sustainable, and then what they're doing. Maybe look at the kinds of training that they've done or kinds of um, outside of entrepreneurial training. Maybe it's other kind of training. So start with the egg corn, the, the core part of what you want to look at. Um, Nadine asked, would it be, would it be wiser to, uh, to select variables based off a survey tool? I love that. I would say survey tools. Well, if, if you have different, let's well, start where you are. If you have a survey tool with different subscales, um, you know, let me just take the MLQ, for example, um, the leadership questionnaire, which has several different leadership characteristics. Yes, you can start, if you have a tool that has different categories or different variables, uh, that's a fine place to start. And you can say, what's the difference among those variables? What's the relationship among those variables? It's very easy, by the way, to start throwing in demographic questions and relating them to the variables. So I don't know what uh, survey tool you're referring to, so I'm just going to go forward with, with uh, my example. Let's imagine you have a leadership questionnaire that has different leadership characteristics. And you can easily put in demographics, gender, tenure, uh, age, something like this, okay? And you can start asking, what's the differences on these leadership characteristics by male and female? What's the relationship between these characteristics or scores on these characteristics with age and so forth? Why is that unique? In my setting, in my HR setting, in my nonprofit, or whatever it is. That's, that's the unique part of it. So, yes, it's good to have a survey tool. I was going to say, look at survey tools. So, if you have survey tool with variable A and survey tool with variable B, now we can see what's the relationship or difference between these two things. Um, Tish asked, my study is, a, is in um, biblical data. How do I incorporate this into a lit review? Um, all different kinds of Bibles and, um, and all different kinds of religions. Um, you're heading down, well, that doesn't necessarily be qualitative. Um, so my question to, my question to uh, Lee, Nadine, Tish, all of you, I'm asking, how have other people looked at biblical data in the lit review. Don't tell me you're the first one either. Okay. Uh, Lee, how have these other dissertations or articles looked at uh, nonprofits and sustainability? Okay. And Nadine, how are people combining variables together? All right. Any more questions? Just keep going forward here. Uh, okay. All right. I'm going to keep going here. Um, okay, so reading, certainly read the abstract. I mean, this is, the idea here is to save time. For those that have, you know, 300 articles, you know, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, we're getting older every day. <laughs> right? So uh, we don't have time to read everything. So read the abstract, read the introduction, read the topic sentences, and get the hints there, right? Um, and then um, skim the discussion section, and then if, if it finds interesting, if it looks interesting, you know, read the article, read the rest of it. But uh, but definitely look at look at the abstract, um, look at the topic sentences, look at the discussion chapter, and and certainly the method and results. If anything, to say, hey, gosh, this is um, uh, th this is the kind of approach that I can get my head around. Hey, this is they have the right variables. Okay, something of this sort. Look out for some of these bullet points below, okay? What's the problem or research question being addressed? You'll notice in these peer review articles, 
typically it's pretty darn clear. It's in the title, right? It's got to be in the title. Um, so, um, okay, look at the design of it. Okay. What kind of analysis are they doing? Look at the sample size. Okay, if it's got a crazy huge sample size, this may not be the study for you or the or the um, uh, the variables to study. So all of these things at the beginning of the day, you want a doable study. At the beginning of the day, you want a methodology to accomplish that doable study. The methodology is the key part here. So I would drill into that methodology pretty closely. I would look at the title, I would look at the abstract, I would look at that method. Is it doable? Okay. Um, the method's going to talk about sample size. It's going to talk about the different measures of uh, the survey instruments. It's going to look at the procedures, describe the procedures. How exactly did they go and administer those surveys to those participants? Um, you, you should always be asking the so what question. Um, it, 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 you, you need to you need to answer that question. If people are bored, and I like to have them a little bit bored where they keep reading, answer the answer the so what question. It's, it's got to keep their interest at some level. And again, keep everything pretty logical. Right? And you'll and you'll see that progression in the when you read through those articles. All right. As you go through those articles, you're going to have to keep some way of tracking all these things. Don't go too crazy with the tracking, but have some organized system. Maybe a note card that you staple to it, a three by five index card. Here's the topics of interest. Okay, here are the variables that they studied. Here's what they found quickly. Okay, and then when you have these, let's just say 30 articles or 50 articles, then you can start organizing them and sequencing these things. That is, laying out how you're going to tell your story like a storyboard. It should be that detailed. Lay it out. It has to make sense. The um, the different types of articles, uh, I don't know who I grabbed this from, you know, just the, the movie analogy of this long shot, medium shot, and close-up shot. You know, if you're studying, you know, cognitive ability in whatever, chimpanzees, okay, um, you know, the, the, uh, the long shot's going to be an article that talks about cognitive ability and a different set of by itself and humans and in chimpanzees, and then you're going to have um, um, other other articles dealing with just cognitive abilities, how they assess it, when they what kind of cognitive abilities, what kind of IQ tests, and so forth. Those are long shots. Just drilling into one of those topics and looking at the whole field of that. The close-ups are going to be, hey. These five articles actually studied cognitive ability in chimpanzees. And those are going to be the, you know, kind of the end of the lit review and where they're going to say, this is what we studied, this is what we found, and here is the other kinds of research we can, we can look at. I want to say something about these peer-reviewed uh, articles, too. Academics, on the whole, are incredibly generous people with their time. And if you have an interest in cognitive ability of chimpanzees, you call them and you email them, they'll often answer the phone. There's not even a gatekeeper there. You can call up and they'll, they'll answer. Um, about 20 years ago, I was interested in attribution theory. And the big people that were alive at the time, they're probably still alive, was Bernie Weiner at UCLA. I lived in Long Beach, California. Bernie Weiner at UCLA and, uh, and, and Lee Ross at Stanford. I call both of these guys up and they both invite me to their offices. I mean, I was a, you know, a kid 
and a master's degree, but they said, ha, ah, you've taken an interest, and they let me come to their office. And these guys were well published and, and um, you know, really leaders, uh, and they've made, you know, they've made contributions. They'll answer the phone. If they don't answer the phone, the heck with them. Call somebody else. But a lot of them do. And uh, don't waste their time. I mean, get your act together before you call them. Um, so I, I just want to say that, that that these people don't be afraid of them. Um, they're they're very human. They're not like business people that are much more closed off and, and you really can't get to them. Um, these academics you can get to pretty easily, I would say. Okay. Uh, organizing your search, keep track of your databases. There's different management software. There's three of them that you can look into. Uh, writing, you don't have to uh, cite everything that you uh, uh, everything that you read. Just have enough to tell your story, okay? with, with perhaps a little bit more, but not too much more. You just want the story. Um, and, and again, you don't want to be putting articles kind of just stuck in there. Don't quote to death. Uh, when you do a plagiarism check, you're going to set off a bell of some sort. Uh, subheadings are enormously helpful. It keeps the reader on track and perhaps keeps you on track. Hey, here's a section I'm really working on. Here's a subheading around that. So um, sub, subheadings are helpful to keep things organized, uh, you but particularly the reader. Summarize the sections as often as possible. Keeping it, people have to keep things in mind. Um, transition between paragraphs. It's just you know decent writing skills. And look at these other articles. You can see. Look at. Pay attention to how they transition between these things. Why do they transition? Because you don't want to abruptly change topics, and you want to tie things together so things flow smoothly all the way through. Okay. All right. Um, this was um, the conclusion of the lit review. Um, um, so you want to solidify the argument of why you're conducting this study, okay. why the study needs to be conducted. And I uh, pulled a few from my own dissertation, which is getting kind of dated these days. Um, and here, here is my kind of summary. You know, several questions were stimulated by the these this study. I will discuss the problematic findings and construct hypotheses that I might blah, blah. One puzzling finding from, I don't know if it was totally puzzling or not, but I said it was puzzling, and the reader thinks it's puzzling, and I'm going to answer, and I already know the answer before I even write that sentence. So you want to simulate a little hunch of, okay, why are we doing what we're doing here? So a couple of limitations of the study, you know, we're hindered by the usefulness, the generalizability, okay. Again, I'm justifying my why I'm studying what I'm studying. I also wondered why, okay? These are the kind of language that you can use to bring the reader from what you've just presented to your study. This is a big old transition. Solidifying your argument and taking them from the lit review, covering the material, into launching them into why I need to be examining these questions now, okay? Then I concluded with, given the above questions and limitations regarding the study, I now present my study to address these issues, okay? That's the kind of thing you want to be doing here. All right. Um, and then I asked two questions. You know, can, my questions are not as important as the kind of things you say to get people there, okay? That's the important part of this. How do you carry them along? And you're moving them from an introduction and importance of the study and a rationale and significance to it to reviewing the body of work around it in a long shot to narrow shot focus, concluding with driving them and pulling them along, okay, We've talked about all these different things, but here with limitations, here's what's still puzzling. 
to, I'm going to examine these things in my questions. That's the point. Good? All right. Um, again, my question is less important. Um, okay, so any questions at the moment? Can we guess if we move here? It doesn't really matter. Huh? Okay. All right, uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, Patricia, um, okay. And uh, Aisha? Aisha, Patricia, Thurman, Lee, Patricia, okay. Um, okay, so here's just a couple of questions before we get to the qualitative piece of these things. Okay, my topic has a lot of research in Canada. Should I keep it from the keep it separate from the U.S. research or combine it? Listen, Canada needs all the help that we can give them. Actually, I don't. No, Canada's fine. Canadian articles, no problem. You don't need to keep it separate. I mean. Right. The, the, the short answer is no. You don't need to keep it separate. Um, uh, would I keep any kinds of things separate? Um, I don't think so. I don't think geography is a separating thing. I think the topics in that lit review are the separating pieces, not the geographic regions. Um, Patricia asked, uh, topic, homeless female veterans, unmet needs. Okay. How do I begin my search? Keyword suggestions to find a new population. Fair enough. Um, but uh, veterans, unmet needs are not a new topic. Okay. That's the place to start. And then start drilling into vet veterans. Uh, I, I, I presume you're referring to when they come back, you know, um, from combat or come back from, from a tour. Um, and um, a homeless, okay, well, so, okay, so let's just take this one for a second. So you have homelessness. That's one big broad shot, right? Homelessness is an issue. Homeless females, more of a narrow shot. Veterans needs that's a that's a big shot. Homeless veterans that's kind of getting into that moderate shot. Then studies around homeless female veterans very narrow. Um, so those are the key words. Start broadly. Homelessness on one hand, veterans needs on another. Female homelessness, female veterans. Homeless female veterans. Those are the kind of the drill downs into this thing. Um, and an important uh, topic, obviously. This is, you know, uh, homelessness got a little spot in my heart. So um, and let me know how that goes, Patricia. Um, approximately how many pages should a good review be? I've seen them, I don't know, 30, 50 pages, um, somewhere in there. Don't be scared by that, by the way. It's, um, you know, once you start doing article by article um, with references, so, you know, somewhere in there. I, I, I don't equate pages with good, good by the way. Um, can you review everything in one page? Probably not. Does a 200-page review mean it's good? No, I don't. So um, the idea is that you're telling a story and you're being comprehensive uh, in that storytelling. Okay, um, Thurman, uh, using the LPI, Leadership Practices Inventory, as an instrument, how do I include this information in the intro and lit review? Well, the LPI, as I recall, has got a, um, and, and I'm surprised the, uh, the MOQ does not, but the LPI, I drilled into this at one point, and they had, all different articles around all different populations that use this. They basically gave you a lit review sitting there on their website with all the different articles. And it seemed to me they even, I want to say that they even gave you an abstract around each one. Um, that's got, that's one of the few things there, Thurman, that they have 
quite a bit around it. Um, look at look at that um, look at their website and and see. There's a lot around that, and they've um, all they could say is and maybe for Mind Garden needs a suggestion too that you know to to really make those articles accessible um, for an instrument and what's been done in it without having to go do the search and, and having people categorize it in some more user-friendly way. Um, I hope I answered the question. Uh, Lee, can you recommend an article that answers the so what question as well? I would look at review articles. Um, I mean, <laughs> you, you have to ask the so what around a particular topic, you know, for example, why study homeless female veterans? Someone has to answer that question. Okay, you have to, you know, fair enough question. Why, why should I care about homeless female veterans? There's lots of answers to that. It could be because females are are, are a different breed than male homeless victims, because homelessness is a problem, and it's a big problem perhaps for veterans. Perhaps we have a different sense of responsibility around veterans. They weren't homeless before they got there. They weren't homeless during, but somehow they've come back and they've been traumatized. So maybe we have a different responsibility to them. All of these are different ways of kind of broaching that so what. We, with the, so, we care because they're female. We care because they're homeless. We care because they're veterans or other things, okay? Um, we care because they're a large population. Okay, there may be large numbers. If 80% of the females that come back become homeless, we have an epidemic on our hands. Or maybe it's 10% or 5%, and that's an epidemic. So we can approach the problem from different points of view. So that's just off the top of my head. So it's a so what, not overall, it's a so what around your particular topic. And how are you going to approach that? Heads up, you want to be thinking about how to, you how you're going to answer that. Um, so, but 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 that's how you start drawing into it. Um, okay. Okay. So, um, qualitative research questions with different kinds of um, or qualitative approaches, phenomenological kind of. Moustakis-esque, talks about lived experiences, grounded theory, tries to build the theory. Um, hypotheses, so, this, so what, what I'm doing here is saying after this broad introduction, I'm studying homeless female uh, veterans, I'm doing the lit review, okay, and I've, I've, I've looked into each of these kind of key words, some of the articles have combined these keywords. I have them in a good sequence. My writing is clear and coherent. Now I'm moving into, you know, uh, why am I, you know, what, what questions am I going to examine? What was puzzling? You know, what, what is puzzling? Why, why is there a higher proportion of female homelessness, veteran homelessness, than males? You know, why study this? So. These are different approaches to kind of getting to that of, you know, what is the lived experience, perhaps, of these female veterans, okay? Um, you know, what, what's, what, what is helping and hindering that process, or what's, what, what's causing that issue? It's a different question than understanding what it's like to be a homeless female veteran of, What's driving those causes? What's the theory behind that? Well, these women had a propensity for this issue. Or women in these situations are dealing with things differently. And the, and the way that we've set up to address trauma, it needs to be different for females, perhaps. You know, what are the contributions of the system, okay? Or the city where they land? Or the reaction to the community, from the community? The reaction from the community to to the uh, Vietnam War was different than the reaction of the community now. So, I mean, what's driving these things? That's a that's a kind of a grounded theory question. 
Um, hypotheses, you don't have to be correct. Hypotheses are just that, okay, educated guesses. They have to be reasonable guesses, um, okay? I mean, so, um, but, but you don't have to be right. Okay. As I say often, if you knew exactly why there was homeless female veterans out there, you wouldn't have to conduct your study. So uh, you, you, want, you want to um, ask questions that are, that are able to be examined. Okay? Um, the questions should make sense to normal people. It shouldn't have to be, especially where we are in the process, okay? Um, you, you shouldn't have to be an expert in veteran affairs to be able to hypothesize that whatever, young women 22 are not handling it well, you know, handling, um, you know, the, the, the traumas of war differently than whatever, some seasoned person. So my point is the questions should be, the hypotheses should be interpretable and understandable. Okay, so um, we're, we're moving on to the end of this. Um, I don't know about you guys. It would be a um, it, was, it was a quick quick 55 minutes for me. I don't know how it was for you all. Um, I want to uh, you know just mention everyone. I think uh, well, I'll take questions and answers uh, in a second. Um, I like to visualize the answers of these things. Uh, certainly, everyone. Everyone that is listening would like to see you graduate in 2015. I can hear the applause. I can I can feel the excitement, and I can see you graduate. So everyone, um, everyone, that means you. Um, you know, feel free to call us um, to set an appointment up. The the, the 30 minute consultation is free. You get to speak with me or, or one of my uh, trusted associates. Um, every, everyone knows the process very well. We've been through it thousands of times. If you have colleagues that are in different stages that can use our help, pass along our phone number or our email address. If you're part of different communities, social media, things of this sort, you have a particular email list, send it out to them. We'll seek you to help. We're seasoned in our jobs. Our intention is correct. Help us help you. Um, so we do all different kinds of things around the lip review and introduction and even the methodology and results and prep defense and all kinds of things. Um, okay. Um, I get to. I'm going to get to Jason's uh, one article, one question too. Um, okay. So, all right. So, um, Jason, well, I guess I'm just going to answer you offline. All right. Um, I want. I want to thank everyone for for your questions. Um, our next webinar is on methodology and IRB. It's a don't miss one. Uh, it's 8.30, November the 19th. Probably we're moving into fall already. Can you imagine that? Um, next thing we, you know, life goes on, doesn't it? And we're moving into Thanksgiving and then on a Christmas and Hanukkah and the New Year. Let's keep things moving, guys and gals. Um, I want to see you graduate. And um, anyway, thanks. thank you so much for your participation, your questions, a lot of you. And uh, we'll see you on the 19th at 8.30. And um, Jason, feel free to, to shoot us an email, and I'll see if I can get you answered offline. Uh, okay, and uh, I think, um, ah, dissertation workshop. Um, for those um, that want to, we have a nice map here, too. Um, this is the bargain of bargains. For $199, you have an all-day workshop with me. How to get through the dissertation in one year. The fee is reasonable. The lodging is reasonable. All you have to do is get there. Dallas-Fort Worth, 
particularly if you're in that area, okay, um, come on down. I mean, this, we've made the price affordable for everybody. 200 bucks. you know, what is that? It's 20 Starbucks coffees or some darn thing. Um, so the fee is reasonable. You can um, call, you can email us at that info at statisticsolutions.com, okay, info at statisticsolutions.com, um, and say that you want to attend that workshop, okay. Uh, at some point, it is going to fill up, or the fees may go up as time goes on. This is a you know pre-sign-up fee, but really, for for under three hundred dollars, you'll get something out of it. Uh, no matter what stage you're at, pass it along. Um, last time we did one in Atlanta, it was fun. Uh, it was it was intimate, and um, you know it was it was a good. Um, and it's right by the air. It's right by the airport. You don't have to rent a car or anything. Despite the fact that there's a first roller car there, uh, you just uh, tram over there. All right. So join us for the workshop. Join us for the webinar. Pass us along. Again, thank you all for attending, and uh, we'll see you all uh, in in November. Thanks so much. Have a great night. Bye, Bye now.